You probably already know if you grew up in the 90s and had a personal computer that LucasArts was one of the kings of point-and-click adventure games. With titles like the Monkey Island series, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, Full Throttle, and Sam and Max Hit the Road, LucasArts established itself as a key player in the genre. They focused more on wacky, offbeat storylines with rebellious characters who often find themselves in silly or weird situations, and that against-the-norm attitude resonated with a lot of people. But by the early 2000s, just like other adventure game companies, they were feeling the strain of the evolving video game industry, and by 2004, the studio officially shuttered its adventure game initiative, cancelling multiple projects that were in the works. This led to several employees leaving LucasArts to form their own studios, one of which, of course, being Telltale Games. Their initial goal was to keep the adventure game genre alive with the same charming, irreverent humor that LucasArts thrived on, with returning IPs like Sam and & Max and Monkey Island, as well as some new properties like Bone, Homestar Runner, and Wallace and & Gromit. While some of these found success and a dedicated audience, none of these titles really broke adventure games back into the mainstream as Telltale perhaps hoped they would. If Telltale wanted to put adventure games back on the same pedestal they were at, they would need to base one on a property that not only would make for a good video game adaptation, but would also draw in a huge audience. Say, something like... Jurassic Park. Ow, oh, shit! Hey Cloud, what's up? Sean, from the channel Wolf Chaos on, like, comment, and subscribe, where did you come from? From your blood! My knowledge of Jurassic Park began at a young age, as our family had the NES game made by Ocean based on the first film, though as for the movies themselves, I wouldn't get to watch them until years later, but man, I absolutely loved them. Or at least I loved the first one. I do think The Lost World is a pretty good film, but the others have been decent at best, but often dip into straight up being bad. I'm still looking forward to seeing Jurassic World Dominion, but I'm not expecting it to match the quality of the original movie. The very first scene I remember watching when it came to the Jurassic Park films was from The Lost World. It being the iconic scene where the little girl was feeding these little green dinosaurs and then she ends up getting, uh, she ends up getting picked apart. Kid me was terrified by that, but I wanted more. I, I needed more Jurassic Park, but my parents turned off the movie uh, quickly after that because they didn't want me to get any nightmares. But then when I got a little older, my parents let me watch the Jurassic Park movies and it changed my life. The cinematography and incredible practical effects fully enraptured me. Whether it be the terrifying Dilophosaurus scene from the first movie, watching the T-Rex run through San Diego and Lost World, or the Raptor Dream scene in Jurassic Park 3. I, I, I have a soft spot for that one. And the franchise naturally lent itself to video game adaptations. I already mentioned the NES game, which I played quite a bit as a kid even though I could never beat it, and I remember spending a hell of a lot of Chuck E. Cheese tokens on Sega's Jurassic Park arcade game back in the day. I know I've played a bit of Konami's Jurassic Park 3 arcade game too, though I remember very little from it, and I recently gave the park builder Jurassic World Evolution a shot, but beyond that, my experience with Jurassic Park games is pretty limited. I've dabbled in quite a few Jurassic Park games such as Jurassic Park on the Super Nintendo. It had a top-down view for most of the game until you went into these labs and then it turned into a Wolfenstein clone. These sections were terrifying as a kid. Actually, they're probably terrifying now. So you go through a door, right, and you see a raptor and they immediately, immediately notice your presence and they run after you as fast as they can. So you either have to react quickly and shoot them or get your face eaten off. Most of the Jurassic Park games don't really have compelling stories. They're either action-focused or park builders. Basically, every Jurassic Park game at the time either involved shooting dinosaurs or putting them in enclosures. Or the weird Jurassic Park dinosaur battles, I I'm not even going to touch that one. Universal wanted a different kind of Jurassic Park game, realizing how stagnant and recycled the Jurassic Park games were becoming. So they wanted to think outside the box and try something new. And that brings us back to Telltale. In June 2010, Telltale announced a partnership with NBC Universal to make two games based on beloved film properties. The first was Back to the Future, which received a more straightforward Telltale adaptation beginning in December 2010. While it didn't deviate from the studio's formula gameplay-wise, it was the largest and arguably most beloved franchise they tackled yet, but the final result showed that they clearly cared about the source material and wanted to do it justice. 
Telltale consulted with Back to the Future co-creator Bob Gale on the story, and brought back voice actors like Christopher Lloyd and Claudia Wells to voice the returning characters. It wasn't anything groundbreaking as a game, but it was a fun adventure that showed their ability to handle larger IPs while staying true to the spirit of the original. Then there was Jurassic Park, and for the narrative, Telltale put in a similar amount of care and attention to detail, setting the story during and immediately after the events of the film while tying up some loose ends. Telltale worked with Universal to ensure the game was accurate to the series' lore and style. In order to live up to expectations of fans, they based the dinosaur behaviors on both the film's creatures and real-life animals, and even consulted a paleontologist during development. But Jurassic Park was far different in tone than Back to the Future, so rather than just going for another stock Telltale adventure game, they shook up the core formula to accommodate a more dramatic mood. They were inspired to do this by both the characters and emotional storytelling of the first Jurassic Park and the 2010 Quantic Dream game Heavy Rain, which had been a huge commercial success. Drama took center stage over the wackier situations of its previous titles, but the biggest change came to the gameplay, as the developers focused more on real-time action and linear storytelling. Jurassic Park The Game launched for PC, PlayStation 3, and Xbox 360 on November 15th, 2011. It ultimately received mixed reviews from both critics and players, and today, it seems to have been largely forgotten by Jurassic Park fans, Telltale fans, and Telltale themselves. You can't even officially buy this game anymore as it's been delisted, and I'm sure the new Telltale isn't prioritizing getting the rights back for now. But while everyone seems to have forgotten about this game, me and Wolf wanted to take a look at it and see A, if it holds up today, and B, what Telltale learned from this game that they applied to their later series. And you know, we found it to be pretty interesting, but let's start at the beginning. We begin the first episode in Media Res, with a woman running through the jungle with a serious bite mark on her arm. And those eyes in the background should clue you in as to why she's running away. You can't see exactly what they are just yet, but given that this is Jurassic Park, you can hazard a guess. And speaking of Jurassic Park, the game lets you know right away that it's serious about the story because of what this woman is carrying. Barbasol can! They knew what we wanted and they gave it to us right out the gate. I remember being a kid wondering what the heck happened to that can and why no one ever talked about it again. Like sure, a T-Rex going to San Diego was cool and all, but we're just gonna completely ignore the can? It seemed like a lot of people wanted that thing and would pay top dollar for it, but I guess, I guess we're just gonna forget about it. But no, Telltale didn't forget about it. And we transition right from that suspenseful scene to what is essentially hide and go seek with dinosaurs. Meet Jerry Harding and his daughter Jess, two of our main characters on this journey. You may remember Jerry from that scene with the Triceratops in the first movie, and for being the father of Julianne Moore's character, Sarah Harding from The Lost World. He didn't make much of an impression in the first film, and he barely makes one here either, with him and Jess, Sarah Harding's half-sister, just playing some I Spy Dinosaur edition while sowing the seeds for some family conflict. Kind of a weird tone change, jumping into sappy family stuff. Oh well, hopefully this is a one-time thing. So then the game fast forwards a bit to the tropical storm scene in the movie, and we see two people caught in the middle, Nima, that woman from the beginning, and Miles Chadwick, the worst character in the game with the most annoying face and voice. We need access passes to get past security. Damn. <laughs> well, look at that. Chadwick is such a bad character that he disconnected my controller. So here's where the game introduces the, well, let's call them exploration sections, where there's a bunch of interactive objects and scenery that whomever you're playing as can notice, comment on, take, etc. You have no control over where your character moves on the screen, you're just moving the camera around and clicking on buttons. At least in The Walking Dead onward, you can walk around, which makes these sections more engaging, but here the characters just kind of stand around and do nothing while you find something to click on. It doesn't help that Chad Dick over there doesn't do much to help besides talking on the phone forever, wasting his damn minutes. I hate Chadwick so much. I freaking hate that we have to travel through this stupid jungle with him. I just want one, just one of these quick time events to let Nima just smack him upside the head with the machete. It can even just be the freaking blunt side. I don't care. Just smack him once, please. <sighs> But yeah, that actually brings up one of the major gameplay mechanics, that being quick time events. And man, there are a uh, there are a lot of them. 
With some of these quick time events, you can make the argument that the tension of the scene is enough to make them interesting, like Nima being chased in the beginning. This is an example of a bad quick time event, where the characters are just walking to a destination and the player can't absorb the atmosphere properly. But it does lead to a familiar sight if you've seen the movie. Nedry's car is still wrecked on the bank where he was, uh, you know, Dilophosaur to death. I really like this part because it uses an element that's familiar to Jurassic Park fans to demonstrate how resourceful this new character is. We obviously know what happened to the Barbasol can, as does anyone who watched the movie, but these characters don't, and Nima figuring it out step by step shows how much of a clever girl she is. And for those who haven't seen the movie, it's a good way to let them intuit what happened to the can alongside Nima. A very nice scene. And it would be a really nice scene if it wasn't for Chadwick. He's such a douche nozzle Th that he will just sacrifice Nima once the officer comes back. I mean, can't this dick just die already? <laughs> No, 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 Cloud. You stop playing sad music. Chadwick does not deserve that. Meanwhile, the Hardings are driving out to the coast to catch a boat off the island, and we have the pleasure to be subjected to their family drama bullshit. You know this story already. The divorced dad who can't pay attention to his child because he's so busy with work, but an extreme and dangerous situation will force them to come together. We've all heard this a million times, and there's nothing new here except that maybe we see things from both perspectives, though that just means we have little to effectively bounce off of. Are they trying to emulate the father-daughter relationship stuff from Lost World? I, I get it, I guess, but that wasn't really one of the movie's strong suits. It felt very forced, and I'm not gonna lie, it uh, feels a lot more forced in this game. Yeah, I agree. If only something could break the tension. <laughs> Nima is not in good shape here, man. They, they gotta get her sedated while inside a fast-moving car. This was a super intense scene where Jerry has to inject medicine into Nima while inside a jeep that's rocking back and forth. The QTE here is nerve-wracking, in the same way that the scene of Clementine patching herself up in Walking Dead Season 2 is. Grizzly stuff. Well, eventually they do sedate Nima, but they can't move any further because there's a Triceratops in the way, and they know what that means. It's time to push. Triceratops doesn't care that you're pushing her, she just want that branch. But finally, after nearly an hour, we get our first dinosaur attack with the big mama Triceratops and a surprise visit by the T-Rex too. And it's cool and all, but it's almost too little too late. This episode's too much of a slow burn. This fight should have happened sooner. I, I get that in the movie, the first real action scene doesn't happen until an hour in, but that movie had great character development before that, and this game certainly does not. Well, it is exciting enough to tucker out Jerry and Sarah, who- How are you gonna be able to take a dad nap after all that? Did, did you watch what I watched? Right, well, then the game introduces us to someone who we don't quite see yet, who sends out a van to Jerry and Sarah. If anything shows how much Telltale cared about getting details right, it's this. You have the option to choose a couple of trams, but some of them don't work. Maybe because they've been destroyed in a T-Rex attack? And hey, you see that helicopter above the visitor center? Yep, that's the one that's carrying the protagonist of the movie away from the island, so we are now firmly past the events of the film, which is pretty cool. Oh heck yeah! The back at the visitor center and the T-Rex is here too. It's just like the end of the movie. Only now the uh the characters just stumble around a box puzzle. Y yay, I guess. Uh. But on the bright side, it looks like Nemo will be okay. I'm actually rooting for her. I like her. Whoa, whoa, take it easy. Take it easy. Don't push yourself. There won't be any rescue. Not for you. So this is a pleasant little intro, you've got some pteranodons flying around with the classic Jurassic Park theme playing, it's very nice and serene. A perfect time then for some fucking mercenaries to show up! After the game gives me a gold medal for just watching a cutscene, we're introduced to a couple of mercenaries sent to rescue the survivors, Billy Yoder, Oscar, and the pilot Decaf. They're here to rescue some other mercs who apparently had already landed here, one of which is this dude named Vargas who's acting all crazy because he's been bitten by something. You know, I feel like I've, uh, I feel like I've seen that before. Oh yeah, The Walking Dead. 
Elsewhere, Nima is holding the Hardings hostage and forcing them to trek to the coast in order to catch a boat. But she's got to take them through some pretty inhospitable terrain first. Are these berries edible? I'm hungry. That plant is poisonous. A handful of those berries is enough to kill a grown man. Oh, they look delicious. Maybe just a couple wouldn't hurt me. Yes. She just told you that those berries would kill you. Why would you still say, hey, let's try some? Eventually, the mercs pick up on their signal, and we get to see their personalities on full display. Billy the hotshot jokester, and Oscar the grumpy old man. I'm not gonna lie, it's, it's pretty crazy to see Billy and Oscar act the way they do, since they both change dramatically and essentially become completely the opposite. That's for later, though, as they've got to get out of this dinosaur storm first. Hang on! Um, excuse me, did that pteranodon just kick the helicopter down? That's fucking ridiculous. We don't have time to worry about that, Cloud. Billy's got to land a freaking helicopter! Oh, steady. Me. Elsewhere, Nima and the Hardings discover this uh, pretty sweet-looking roller coaster. I will say that this episode starts pretty slow, but this roller coaster set piece is awesome. It's a good puzzle leading into a really fun action scene, and it's a nice change of pace from just the same jungle and forest environments we've been seeing. Wow, so uh, so they're really just going to ride this incomplete coaster down to the bottom? Do they really think that's a smart idea? I don't know, Wolf. But I do know that you should ride the new Velocicoaster at Islands of Adventure. It has twists, it has turns, it has exposed metal pipes. Be the first to experience the coaster that received the most dangerous ride award at the 2011 Coasties. And when it's all over, our live dinosaur meet and greet is the perfect way to end your day at Universal. The Velocicoaster! Only at Universal's Islands of Adventure! in Orlando, Florida. <coughs> well, anyway, the mercs rescue everybody, it's revealed that Nima and Oscar clearly have a past, and the T-Rex comes, oh my god, it knocks their helicopter down too. But they're actually okay. Oh, but a pteranodon can fucking demolish it. <sighs> Let it go, Cloud. Last up to be rescued is Dr. Laura Sorkin, the woman who sent out the car for the Hardings in the last episode. Ooh, I'm not... I'm not liking that Sorkin. Sorkin's acting like a villain right there. Glare, glare on the glasses, glare on the glasses, that's an anime villain trope! And here's where the game loses me for a bit, as it chooses the most boring way to introduce a character. The conceit is that you're digging up dirt on Sorkin in order to persuade her to leave, but in reality, you're just moving from character to character, clumsily working through dialogue options until you find the right bit of info. It's such an unnatural process that just makes the character seem undeveloped. But hey, at least we got to hurt some parasaurs! Okay, I'm bored again. Can something exciting happen? Down here! Yeah, that'll work. So while the Hardings and Dr. Sorkin escape from some raptors, whose faces kinda glitched up for me, the mercs and Nima in the helicopter go down, but don't worry, they're fine. Wait, they actually are fine? How the piss are they still alive? They they should be burnt to a crisp by now. You're, you're gonna tell me generic ball head McGee is fireproof? I don't believe that. You shut your piss mouth. So Billy just kind of discovers the trick behind the Barbasol can just by holding it in his hand, and the justification feels forced. I get they needed some way for Billy to discover the embryos, but it almost goes against the idea of the can as a foolproof storage system. I mean, if a dumbass like Billy can figure out the shaving cream trick, then I guess it wasn't that good of a plan, Dodgson. Okay, so now everybody's in the underground tunnel network, and this is where the game just... It just slows down to a crawl with the characters just arguing with each other. Like, Jerry's mad with Sarah because she keeps disobeying. Sorkin's mad with Jerry because they disagree about keeping the dinosaurs locked up. Nasser's mad with this raptor for... Oh no, wait. He's just gonna brutally murder the dinosaur. Holy crap, it never stood a chance. I miss him already. Now, when Billy and Nima meet up with Oscar here, Billy tries to cut Oscar in on the deal he has with Nima, and you decide how Oscar reacts, either outright acceptance or denial, or not being sure. 
This is a small choice, and ultimately, it doesn't affect the story in any way, but in hindsight, it forecasts the direction Telltale would go in. Most of the other dialogue choices in this game aren't choices at all, forcing you to find the option that advances the story, but this is the first instance where a choice can provide a personal insight into a character. Oscar has a character arc rather than just a plot arc. You see, Oscar has to come to the realization of the sins he's committed, and by being with these people, he starts to, you know, become self-aware of what he's done and what actions have led to where he is now, and that they don't just affect him, but so many other people. And you really see that he starts to change as time goes on into a better person who's trying to atone for the sins that he's committed. It's better than the rest of this dumb drama, at least, so it's a good thing when a more intense section happens with the boiler, which the players need to reset correctly, or it will explode. Please don't blow up, please don't blow up, please don't blow up. I think you'll find we have nothing to worry about. No, obviously that doesn't happen, but there are some raptors to deal with, and Oscar sacrifices himself in order to open the way out for the others. Oscar! There's nothing you can do. You're a good man, Oscar. You... You were a good man. Well, at the end, not uh, not whenever you were, you know, committing war crimes, but after that. So now everyone's trapped in a supply closet with raptors on their tails, and also the dead body of the helicopter pilot decaf. So, uh, you know, Billy's not gonna be happy about that. I'll kill you. Yeah, really not happy. By this point in the game, it's time to get a good look at our main antagonist dinosaurs, the Truradons. They're the ones who caused Nima's bite in the beginning and what she was running away from, and they're also responsible for killing Decaf. Or maybe not killing Decaf, because it turns out he's still alive! Decaf's eye moving and still being alive is legit a scary moment. You know, not even scary, not even scary. A horrifying moment. Like, I am actually surprised that this was put in a teen-rated game. Like, th this is very unsettling. The horror moments in this episode, well, these last two episodes, are extremely effective. Like, it makes me wish that Jurassic Park would tap into this element more. You, you could make a great, great survival horror game off of Jurassic Park, but that, that's a story for another day. What I'm talking about now is Telltale and how effective and how well made these moments are because it is so suspenseful and creepy and you, you feel trapped. It, they do such a good job with this. Then the Truodons breach into the room, and I gotta say they don't look nearly as intimidating in full light, but they're scary enough to force our heroes to flee into a puzzle where they have to read maps and investigate tunnels. I personally like this sequence as I'm always keen on puzzles that revolve around reading maps, although if you're not good at that or don't notice certain details, it could take forever. Then there's another Trudon chase and everyone gets separated again. It does lead to a nice scene where Nima actually develops her character. I gotta say, it's nice to have a character with some good backstory here that ties into the park itself. It makes her feel like she's earned her place in this narrative, and it's also a side of the Jurassic Park story that we haven't seen before, the Costa Rican side. Hearing a perspective on how the native people responded to this place being built is pretty great and provides another shade onto Nima's character. Much better than the others, who head into a marine exhibit and talk about, uh, I don't know, fish or something. They're raising these fish to feed another animal. Like at Marine World. Marine World! It's like SeaWorld, but probably worse. You know what, no, I can't even, I can't even in good conscience make that joke. Like, I guarantee you, I guarantee you that SeaWorld is worse than Marine World. Wanna know why? You wanna know why? Because Marine World probably actually, you know, wants their creatures to live and actually cares about them, whereas SeaWorld doesn't give two pisses in a pine cone about their animals. They want them to just, you know, go on stage and make everybody <coughs> yay happiness. Shut up! You let Shamu out! And don't you dare ever forget the sin you committed that is called Shamu's Deep Sea Adventure. You know what you did to people. You know the pain you caused. You know I will never forget that trauma. But, but, it's over for now. I sent that game someplace where it will never, ever hurt anyone again. Oh, so that's where that came from. 
Okay, so there's a lot that happens in this episode that isn't really exciting to talk about. So let's run down all the salient points. Everyone meets up at the marine exhibit, Billy fully turns into a villain and calls for a nuclear strike, Dr. Sorkin turns traitor on the mall and then dives to the Mosasaur, and everyone needs to escape by donning some scuba deer and swimming through the Mosasaur exhibit. It's a very intense scene, and the death scenes here especially can be terrifying. But speaking of which, there are a lot of death scenes in this game. A first for Telltale, and Walking Dead especially would become famous for them. And I gotta admit, a lot of them in Jurassic Park are downright silly. Wait, Clad, Clad, hold on, hold on. Can we please just just see Chadwick die again, J please? Uh, okay, I'll allow it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're finally at the end of the game with all our friends: Jerry, Sarah, Nima, the T Rex, and Billy. Oh, uh, actually, maybe, maybe not Billy. And finally, we come to the biggest decision in the game. Nima has to choose between saving Jess's life or saving the dinosaur embryos. If she goes after Jess, then the two survive, but the embryos are lost forever. But if she does go after the can, she gets eaten by the T-Rex, presumably along with the can, and Jess just kinda saves herself. So you can choose to have them both live while destroying the dinosaurs, or kill Nima off in an undeserved fashion while destroying the dinosaurs. This isn't a great choice. Uh, taking the embryos feels antithetical to Nima's character development to this point. This is a choice for the player and not the character. And not only that, it's a super underwhelming one. It's really not even a hard choice. It's just, you would have to go out of your way to choose the embryos in this situation. Whatever your choice is, the Hardings escape either with Nima or without because she, you know, died and they sail away on the boat to presumably never do anything interesting again. So that's Telltale's Jurassic Park. It has some ups, it has some downs, and ultimately, I think its biggest legacy wasn't that it enhanced the Jurassic Park story in any meaningful way, as for the most part, it really didn't. But what it did do was lay down the first bricks of the foundation that Telltale would later use for The Walking Dead. Many forget that this game exists, and I don't exactly blame them, especially because their next project would create such a huge splash that it rocketed past basically everything that Telltale produced beforehand. Uh, but Cloud, technically Telltale's next game was Law & Order Legacies. Shut up, Wolf. Nobody cares about that, and neither do you. Overall, I wouldn't say that Telltale's Jurassic Park is all that good, either as a JP game or a Telltale game, but I've grown to appreciate a lot of what it tries to do. It's the only Jurassic Park game I've played that really cared about telling a story beyond the basic premise of, look out, there are dinosaurs, and while your opinion on how well it fits into the series might vary, I think it has enough interesting set pieces and love for the original film to get a pass from me. While Jurassic Park the game has quite a few slip-ups, I do believe it was the building block that pushed Telltale forward and was a nice homage to the original trilogy. It sought out to be a game about the Jurassic Park story and expanding upon it. Sure, you can tell they tried a little too hard to recapture that father-daughter aspect that The Lost World had, even though that, uh, that felt a little forced in the film as well. But there was a lot of heart put into this game. They tried to make something that Jurassic Park fans would love, and they did that even with the death scenes for crying out loud. Th there are some down moments with this game, there's no denying that. But when the good moments hit, man do they hit hard. I think this is one of the best Jurassic Park games and easily has some of the best heart put into it. And for Telltale, it represented a stepping stone that allowed them to take the big leap into the next dimension, and had it not been for the lessons learned on this game, Walking Dead might not have turned out as tight as it did. It's an important step for the company, even if objectively, it's got a ton of story and gameplay flaws. I just, uh, I wish Oscar was still around to see this. Hey everybody, if you like my weird jokes and input, feel free to check out my channel WolfKeosan. I focus on comedic video game reviews and just recently released a video where I played every version of Glover because I'm a freaking idiot. <sighs> Mistakes were made. But I hope I made you laugh, and Cloud, I just want to say thank you so much for having me for this game. Oh, video. Video game. 
Thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, then give it a like, leave a comment, and make sure to subscribe and click that bell to get notified when new videos go live. Thanks also to Wolf Kiosan for going on this Jurassic Park journey with me. Be sure to check out his channel as well. The link is in the description. Until next time, this is Cloud Connection and Wolf Kiosan signing off.